right, so hello and welcome to Tactics Time. Fortunately, Dennis is going to be here this week, so I'll be taking over. Um, and uh, this week, we're going to be go going over situations when it's actually better to not make a queen with your pawns. And you want to make some other piece instead, like a knight or a bishop or a rook even. So for example, in this position, if white were to play rook to g8 and black were to take on g8, uh, what should white play here? Yeah? K8. And what piece do you want to make? Pawn. <laughs> okay, so what happens when the pawn gets to the end of the board? It gets the queen, or anything that wants to get out of the Yeah. Queen. So what do you want to turn it into? A uh, queen. Uh oh. Right. So what happens if you make a queen here? It's black's turn, right? So can black play anything? Yeah, so black can't play anything. So this is what's called stalemate. So when the queen is covering all of these squares, the pawn is covering this square, and the king is covering these two, this king can't move. So the game would end in a draw. So what you have to do instead is make a different piece. So for example, a knight or a bishop would work. Would a rook work? Nah, it's still the same stalemate. So yeah, we have to make a knight or a bishop. So I think a bishop's best. So king to b8, king to b6. And if black tries to cover the queening square, we can simply check him away and make a queen. All right, so that's one of the times when you're going to want to look out and actually promote to something other than a queen, is when your opponent has no moves and you don't want to end the game in a draw. So we're going to look real quick at another end game example. And this time, we're going to promote to a knight or a bishop or a rook for different reasons. So black has plenty of moves, but the problem is he also has a queen. So what we need to do is find a way to promote this pawn. So how could white try to get that pawn promoted? Yep. OK. And if I take it? Promote with check. All right, but the problem is, can you win queen and bishop versus queen? Yeah, I don't think so. It's not very easy at all. In fact, I think it's technically a draw. Yes, yeah, so we need something better than c8 equals queen. Yeah, Aditya? Equals rook? Well, that's even worse, right? Yeah, so black just steps out of the way, and then he's up a queen. So yeah, I think he's right. Checking with the bishop first lets you use a knight, get an a. Yeah, you get in a knight fork when the queen. Right, right. So after bishop d5 check, black's only move is to go to a7. And now, of course, we don't promote to a queen when we would have the same endgame, but we make a knight. Then after the king moves away, we can take the queen. Okay, now I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure ev everyone here knows this checkmate by heart. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, right. I wasn't sure if I could do Yeah, but this is actually the only way for white to play here. Yeah. Because if you try something slow, uh, for example, playing bishop d5 here, to prepare rook a8, you just get checked forever. And you can never really get out of it. And you might end up getting forked somewhere, and it'd be terrible for everyone. So rook to a8 is the only way to win. So what happens on rook to a8 if black tries to play away like this? Yeah, you still just make a knight, or a queen even, is probably enough. And you fork the king and queen. Yeah. So that's another situation when you want to make a knight, when uh, you can distract black's pieces or your opponent's pieces and then end up making a fork when you queen or knight. All right, so now we're actually going to look at a game. So this is an end game Karpov had against uh, someone no one's ever heard of. 
in 1962. <laughs> so, uh, here, as you can see, black is up one pawn on the king's side and has a bishop for the knight. So black's definitely trying to press for a win here. So Karpov started by playing h5. So he did this because he wants to get his pawn going down the board. All right, so white made a waiting move. And now black continued uh, with his plan with, after king to d4, eyeing some of these squares. So knight to d3 trying to cover up his weaknesses. So bishop d6, moving out of the uh, out of the threat. After knight to f2, bishop g3, knight to d3. Karpov finally plays g4. So his plan is very difficult to stop. He's just going to play g1 and make a queen. So white takes, because you want to trade pawns when you're trying to draw in a minor piece endgame especially. So knight to b2, just waiting. Bishop f4. Knight to d3, again stepping out of the threat, just bishop to d6. King to d2, and now Karpov decides to push. So white decided to be kind of tricky, and instead of playing something like knight to e1 to just defend against the pawn push, he instead played a4. So now what Karpov did actually isn't the best move. What Karpov did is push the pawn. So how can white try to punish this? Because it looks like he's going to queen by force, and you can't really stop it. It's white's move, yes. Well, there's no stalemate, because you have these pawns over here. So you'll always have some legal moves. Yeah, so what happens after knight to e1 if black makes a queen? Yeah, you have the fork. So this would be a huge mistake. Because white could play here, black would move away, and white could take the queen. And now it's just an easy draw. But Karpov noticed this. So what do you think he played instead? What's the only piece a knight can't fork? Another knight. Another knight, that's right. So knight, or g1 equals knight, defending the f3 square, playing around the fork. So then Karpov obviously went on, got his knight into the game. And after a little bit of uh, trying, he managed to trade off the knights. And his opponent resigned here. Because like a takes b4 and bishop takes b4 are both easily winning for black, especially since this is a dark square. So uh, the bishop can easily help the pawn promote. So what uh, could Karpov have done to avoid this, do you guys think? from this position. Obviously, it was still winning, but uh, there was something a lot more convincing. What, what could Karpov have done to avoid having to make a knight and play out that endgame? Can you push the C-pawn? Yeah, that's actually right. So what happens if white takes the pawn? Well, you could take the pawn, and that's still winning. But uh, there's something even better. Uh, not quite, because the knight's covering it. Well, actually, yeah, the knight wouldn't actually be able to take on b4. But I think white could bring his king closer to the pawn. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's look at that for a second. The other side. So if white takes this knight, white can't stop this pawn from promoting. But uh Yeah, so what if white plays king to e2? Well, this is also probably easily winning, but uh, there's, there's a line even better than, than this. Maybe. All right. I'll just give you guys the answer. So it's just playing the same move as he tried before playing c4. So what was the point now? What if, what if white plays knight to e1 with the same idea? Uh, well, yeah, you plan the king. Or you can. You still have, you still have the floor. You can still promote to a knight. 
Well, yeah, he could, but yeah, now he has another B4. option. King so yeah, yeah, yeah. Bishop b4 check is the idea. So after king to e2, you can take the knight, and now you make a queen. So yeah, Karpov, I don't think actually missed this idea. I think he just felt like making a knight and having a bit of fun. But... Was it a side wall? No, it was actually a standard tournament in Chelyabinsk in 1962. But uh, yeah, his opponent was uh, not a very famous person. I don't think he has any other recorded games in history besides this one. But so yeah, that was Karpov under promotion. All right, now we're going to one that some of you might have already seen. And uh, this promotion wasn't forced, and it didn't turn out to be very fun either. So I'm gonna I'm gonna call this one a failure. <laughs> So this is a game Hikaru Nakamura recently played in the Paris Grand Chess Tour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so most of you are probably thinking, well, it looks like black might even be better because this pawn's farther down the board. But this end game is actually just dead drawn, and neither side really has any, ch any chances here. The reason is, after white or black makes a queen with check, white is forced to take it, and then black can just take this pawn. And then it's an easy draw. All right, but if I were to tell you that black actually lost this game, <laughs> what do you think he played? Check with the rook. Uh, check f3. Rook to f3, yeah, not quite. He didn't make an obvious, obvious blunder. He decided that he was just going to promote to a knight because he didn't think it mattered. He thought, oh, white's just going to take it and we're going to transpose into the same thing. It'll just be a bit of fun. I'll make a knight. However, However white has this move, rook to f2 check. So now what's wrong with playing king to g3? Because if white just takes here and black just takes here, you get the same thing. But white has a better move here. King f3 check. I mean, rook f3 check. Right, so rook to f3 check. And the pawn's stronger than the knight. And if the king moves away, yeah, that's right. You don't take the knight. You actually trade rooks. And the point is, after h6, the knight cannot catch this pawn. And white would be winning. So this means black has to come down the board to g1, which allows white to take the knight with check. So now after the king moves away, white can simply uh, check again and defend his pawn. So actually, Nakamura hadn't blown the game yet. He had just, uh, he had just uh, played a little inaccurately and given his opponent an extra pawn. But he, I imagine he was pretty flustered after missing rook to f2 check and rook takes f1 with check. So he played some very inaccurate moves. But this game is actually pretty easily drawn. And the drawing idea is to do nothing, <laughs> which is sometimes difficult, especially in a blitz game when you have no time on your clock. But if black actually plays king to h2, and then king to h1, and then king to h2, and then king to h1, and then king to h2, white has no winning tries. Because as soon as you move the rook away from this pawn, for example, rook to f2 check, king to h1, you have to come right back to defend it. And if you try to get your king in, well, you just can't, because my rook is covering all of the squares on this rank. So for example, if rook f3, that just loses this pawn. So there's just no chances for white. Unfortunately for Nakamura, let me flip over the notation here and get back to the game. Uh, he played some very bad moves. So he played rook to a3 here, which what does this allow white to do? Well, sure, he can check. But yeah, it lets him get his pawn one square farther down the board. So now he has to come back, or else the pawn will keep pushing. And we get the same position, except that the pawn is farther down the board. So now this is still a draw. You still have this idea of king to h2 to h1 to h2 to h1. And white can't really do anything about it. But unfortunately for Nakamura, he played king to h2, so that's fine, king to f2. And now he played rook to h4. So what does this allow white?
The rook was doing a very important job on h3. What is it no longer doing? Yeah, so now white takes his space, and he's getting closer to his pawn. So Nakamura plays king h3, which is fine. And after rook here, uh, he's forced into playing some moves he doesn't want to play. For example, if you play rook to h5, just trying to pass, first of all, white could come off the board. And secondly, rook to g1 uh, threatens rook to h1 with checkmate, and also some other things Maybe as well. Uh, king to h2, I think, would have been his best try. When after king to g1, you simply have to check and play rook h4 again, and this is another draw. But instead, he missed, he missed all this stuff. yeah, he missed all this stuff. To be fair, he was playing on three second increment. So he had three seconds to actually physically make his move and hit his clock. So he was basically playing instantly. That but, delay. Not sorry, yeah, delay. So he didn't get any time back. He had to make every move in under three seconds. So instead, he played rook, H, rook to a4. And what does this allow? Yeah, you just push the pawn again. And after rook to h4, this is actually a losing position by this point. So the game continued rook to g7, rook h6, king f4, king h4, king f5, rook h5, king to g6. And now the king helps the pawn get to the end of the board. And black resigned here because of king to g8 and pawn to h8. So sometimes, sometimes, especially when you have low time on your clock, it's not good to be fancy, right? Even a bishop here would have been better, because it checks the king and forces white to take. Did you say post-interview why he did that, or why he didn't go to the Nakamura wasn't giving any interviews that day. <laughs> he, uh, I think he preferred to be left alone after that game, but uh, yeah, he was just trying to be fancy and uh, play a fun move. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that game was certainly tragic for Nakamura. All right, moving along, I'm going to show you guys kind of a more fun puzzle that would never happen in a real game, but uh, illustrates some nice ideas. So it's white to move here, and white is trying to checkmate black's king. So this is just a fun puzzle. So what do you think white should play? <laughs> all right, first of all, you have to notice the big problem. The problem is none of black's pieces can move, right? Sorry. This is his only move. So black's only going to have one move, and then he's in stalemate again. So we have to find a way to prevent that from happening. And it's black's move now? It's white's turn. It's white's turn. Yes. White to move and win the game. <laughs> and there's no trick once where the pieces are going. Nope. White's pawns are going this way, black's pawns are going this way. That's it. It's a very counterintuitive idea. But once you see it, you'll be amazed that you couldn't think of it before. Right, so now if you just try to play, for yeah, example, play king to g here. Yeah, now move the king again, give him space. Now the king but can move. Still can't now move. the king can't move. The pawn covers that square. So we need something else. Pushing the pawn. It might do you well to remember the theme of this lecture. <laughs> it's all about under promotion. Okay. So you're gonna put, you're gonna Okay, so promote the pawn to a knight. Okay. And after So then he put then he moves forward. Now put the knight back to uh, Oh yeah, let it get taken by black. Put the knight to G six or That's right. So the only move that gives black a legal move, so black has to take, it's his only legal oh, move. Of course. And now you promote another pawn. And what do you play here? Yeah, you have to promote to a knight again. So black plays his only legal move, and now you play. Oh, oh. <laughs> and you're just so, yeah, so now you play knight to e6, forcing black to take. And then here. 
Yeah, you make another knight. That's right, Aditya. All right. And then what do you play here? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Knight to c6, giving up the knight. So push the pawn, black pushes, and now what do you play? No. Yeah, you make a knight with checkmate. So that's just a fun puzzle that I thought I'd share with you guys because I really enjoy it. So yeah, that's White's only way to win. Uh, All of those promotions are first. So. All right, sure. All right, so back to a more realistic scenario. We're going to look at an end game that often pops up in a, uh, a lot of games, a lot of Grandmaster games this has been seen in. This is just one example. So here it's white to move. And so white is going to try to promote this pawn. So he plays king to f7. Uh, black realizes he can't stop this pawn from promoting, so he gives up his rook. And white takes. So now my question to you is, can white stop this pawn from promoting? Nope. No? Did you count? I've been in this situation. <laughs> yeah? King is too close to the pawn. Well, what the real problem is, is this king is too far away. Right. But what happens when the king is just a little bit too far away from the pawn is white can force a knight versus rook endgame. All right, so if you can imagine, White brings his queen closer, because this rook can't stop this pawn all on its own. If you play something like a rook to c7, sorry. Here, if you play something like rook to c7, just trying to stop the pawn, black will simply move away. He won't step in front of the pawn, because that gives white time to bring his king in. But if he just steps away, if you come here, he'll step back. And if you come here, he'll step away. And you can't really stop this pawn from pushing down the board with the rook alone. So you definitely need the king to come in in order to, in order to stop the pawn. So king to d5, black pushes his pawn. White gives this check in order to get his king closer. So king to c2, king to c4, b2. And now from here, how can you guys uh, prevent black from making a queen, at least? Without sacrificing your rook. You check with the rook. All right, so you check with the rook. I'll step down. Push the king. Push the king where? Well, the king moves, it has to go to c3. Right, so what happens on king c3? And then if black makes a queen? Oh, you don't win the queen. Oh, you win the game. You win the game. That's right. So if he makes a queen, this is simply checkmate. And black can't move away because white will take the pawn. White can't. Black can't move this way because white will take the pawn. So what does black have to play? Knight. Yeah. Why? Why is the knight working? Because it's check. That's right. So black gives check to white's king and saves the game. Because a knight versus rook, when the king and the knight are right next to each other, usually is a draw. I don't want to go into like specifics of this, because I mean, even I'm not sure on all the technicalities. But as long as the knight and the king can stay close to each other, it's usually a draw. So they played on for a few more moves. White did his best to drive the king and knight away. But black simply keeps them working together. And here, white agreed to a draw. But yeah, if you don't know this, know this idea, and you're playing a blitz game, for example, after king to c3, you might make a terrible mistake. But it's important to keep in mind that you can't make a queen here because of this checkmate. So that comes up more often than you realize. But uh, yeah, it's not too important because it's still a draw for black, even though white can make up this uh, subtle threat with king to c3. But uh, it's. Definitely one of the most common under promotions that you'll see. All right, and now for an opening trap. All right, so if you can imagine, black is going to promote to a knight on move seven. All right, so that sounds pretty absurd, but let's see how it happens. So it comes out of the queen's pawn game, the queen's gambit, and actually the Albin counter gambit is what this is named. 
So striking in the center immediately, trying to break down white's d pawn. So white accepts the pawn. And now black's point to his play is he gets to play d4, preventing this knight from coming to a natural square and grabbing some central space. So one of the most natural moves when your opponent's uh, pushing a pawn deep into your camp is to try to get rid of it, right? So how can white try to get rid of this pawn just right away? E3 looks good enough. E3 looks good enough? Well, you've fallen into the same trap that white made. All right. So the way white normally continues is simply playing knight to f3. And after some more moves, like uh, knight to c6, for example, white fianchettos, and sometimes black castles queenside, and white plays something like queen to b3 or knight to d2, and you just get a normal game. But uh, instead, here, falling for a trap, white plays pawn to e3. So we're on move four, and remember, Black's making a knight on move seven, so we better, we better hurry up. So what happens if black just takes on e3? Why can't you just trade off queens and take back the bishop? Yeah, that's right. You just trade off queens and take back the bishop, and white's position is amazing. White's probably close to winning with this extra pawn and this lead in development. So black can't do that. So black needs something better instead. Check. Which check? Yeah, the bishop check. So the bishop checks on b4. And white wants to defend with tempo so he can maintain this threat on the pawn. So he plays bishop to d2, attacking your bishop. So now is where the tactics begin. What do you think black can play here? It's move five. We've only got a couple more moves to make our knight. Take what? Bishop. Well, you could take the bishop, but then we get something similar to, uh, to the other line, right? Because if you take here, I can simply take with my queen, or trade queens and take with my f pawn, and white's totally fine. So we need something more active. Yeah, Ken? Pawn takes pawn. Pawn takes pawn, that's right. So you hung your bishop. No, not queen takes queen. We don't want to trade queens. That's actually going to be a tech. Oh, yeah, you're <laughs> And then after pawn takes pawn, white can simply yeah, develop, he and he's totally fine. So this is kind of actually a common tactic in a few different openings. Sometimes it's uh, a pawn, pawn takes on F2. So yeah, pawn takes F2, pawn. check. So sometimes it's a bishop doing this tactic, and I think it comes up in Sicilians when you're not careful enough. But uh, why can't white take this pawn? What happens if white takes here? It drops the queen. It drops the queen, right? So we have this threat on the queen, and we have this threat on the king. So what's white's only reasonable move here to try to keep the queen? Uh, yeah, king to e2. So king to e2. And now black has a problem, because if black takes here and just makes a queen, white will simply recapture. And you have one, two, three pieces to one, two, three pieces. And sorry, white won't simply recapture. White will probably trade queens and then recapture. So we need something a little bit faster and then taking on g1 and making a queen. Promoting a knight. Right, so you make a knight, and this is check. And now that forces the king away from the queen. Well, no, it forces white to capture, right? And it doesn't exactly force white to capture, but uh, for the sake of the trap, we'll, we'll show this line. So Rick takes g1, and now what was the point of forcing white to recapture instead of taking on d8 first? What has white allowed? The bishop can come in. Right, so bishop g4, check, skewering the king and queen. So after the king moves away, white will simply lose his queen. So because of this, it's actually better for white to decline taking the knight and play king to e1 here. 
But uh, after a few more moves get played, such as queen to h4 check, when you can't play g3 because queen to e4 will fork your king and rook, so you have to play something like king to d2 here, and simply something like knight to c6. And uh, the very few times this has been played over the board, white just gets checkmated within 20 moves. So it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely not a line you want to fall into. But what would happen, as I said, if black takes here and makes a queen? How does white escape from this bishop g4 idea? So you trade off the queens before recapturing. And now, there's less and now there's no skewer on d1, so the king can simply move away. So right here, the only move that maintains an advantage is taking the knight with check by promoting to a knight. So the moral of the story is, don't play e3 here. It's very, very bad. <laughs> and your opponent will be very joyful if uh, he sees that move played. All right. So moving along, I think I have one more game for you guys. And we're actually going to go through the whole game for this, because it is interesting. And there are a lot of attacking ideas. And this is tactics time, after all. So it starts off with a Slav. White plays knight to c3, black plays knight f6, uh, knight to f3, and we get the Chabonenko. Slav, I think. So white or black's idea here is he wants to play b5 very early and lock up the queen side before white can do anything like attacking a weak c6 pawn, attacking a weak b7 pawn. He wants to avoid all of that. So white plays e3, simply defending this pawn, because if he were to play some other move, such as bishop f4, uh, black is probably threatening to take this and then play b5 and holding on to this pawn against all odds. Does A5 not, does A4 not work in this variation? Uh, A4 is probably an okay move. I mean before this point, though. Before this point? Yeah. Oh, you mean A4 here? Yeah, this point. Uh, it's probably okay. It's a little strange to leave this square so open. Uh, for example, like, oftentimes a knight ends up coming here through A6 after, like, A5 is played, and yeah, I mean, a4, I think it might be a move, but uh, black's still under no obligation to take this pawn, so maybe it's a little, a little strange. But yeah, I think e3 is more common. So then black strikes back against the c4 pawn by playing b5. So now white decides he's going to gain some space and prevent any pieces from coming to these squares for the rest of the game. But the drawback of this is that it's very difficult to break open the queen side now. So white's going to have to find play over here. So black decides to fianchetto his bishop, since it can no longer come to this diagonal, because this pawn is in the way. So white develops his bishop. And now black plays an interesting move. So what do you think the break black is playing for is going to be? So black's going to try to make a pawn break somewhere. And he needs to figure out where it's going to be and how he's going to get it in. Knight on B to D2? Uh, I'm talking about a pawn break. So yeah, developing your pieces is always fine. Knight B to D7 is a fine move. But uh, usually in openings, there are certain pawn breaks you want to look after. So. Here, white's most advanced pawn is on c5. So black's probably looking to undermine it somehow. So yeah, I'd look to play e5 eventually, I guess. Or... So yeah, what you want to do is eventually play this move to gain yourself some space. And if white tries to take it, he'll leave this pawn very weak. But it's not ready. So you can't play e5 now. So black plays an interesting idea, which uh, trades off a piece that controls e5 for a piece that can never control e5. So what do you think that idea might be? Yeah, bishop to g4. So this bishop, uh, black decided, was not going to be very good with all of these pawns sitting on light squares. And this knight controlling the pivotal e5 square is a good enough piece to trade it off for, black decided. Okay, so what's the name of this, this is the Chabonenko Slav. 
And it is the Shabbat after like a6 and b5. These ideas are what denotes it. So uh, white plays h3, and bishop takes f3, following through the plan. And now white can actually uh, make a decision here. So it would make a lot of sense to take it with the queen, because it just develops your own piece. But uh, you can also take with the pawn. And the point is, first of all, it gives you this nice g file. And while it does kind of shatter your pawn structure and leave these pawns more weak than they were before, it allows white to do uh, something very important. And that is after bishop g7, or knight b7, either one makes sense, is you can play f4. So what does this move do? So yeah, it's controlling the e5 square even more than before. So black still has gotten rid of this bishop. But uh, now, instead of for control of the e5 square, it instead traded itself off to weaken white's pawn structure. But uh, I think this has scored pretty well for white in the past, and this is the main idea. But Svidler decided he wanted to take with the queen. So he did. Uh, black continued bishop to g7, just developing. And now uh, white decided to strike quickly with g4. So white's idea is to find play on the king's side by playing h4, h5, trying to open this up and open up his rook. So black decided uh, now is the time for his pawn break because he needed to play quickly since white was being so aggressive. So black plays e5. So how do you think white responded to this? Do you think white took here or played something else? Uh, that's right, he didn't take. So white probably didn't like the way uh, this line looked after something like knight f to d7, attacking both of white's weak pawns, and opening up this bishop. And uh, so he instead opted for queen to g3. Because what happens if uh, white just ignores it and plays something like b4? He gets yeah, he, he gets forked on e4, attacking two pieces. So he can't allow that. So instead, white moves his queen out of the way. And black continued with knight uh, f to d7, again trying to open up this bishop, uh, take on d4, and get some play. So white played knight to e2, just defending the pawn, keep er keeping everything closed for the moment. And uh, here black plays queen to e7, again just supporting this pawn, preparing an, an eventual e4 if he so desires. So white continues with his development, just gets castled, and black plays h5. So the reason black played this move is because he was concerned with this pawn break, which uh, would be kind of strong for white. And also, uh, he wanted some more space and to try to get activity of his own for his rook. So he did play the committal h5, which maybe, maybe better would just be to castle and just to face the oncoming pawn storm, with the brave face. But uh, black was feeling ambitious, so he, he went for h5. And white decided that he would just defend his pawn with f3, simple enough. And here black plays knight to f8. So again, he's trying to open up this bishop by playing knight to e6 and putting even more pressure onto this pawn. And what's your opinion? You got both knights all the way back. <laughs> right. Back, right? So this is what white's thinking as well. White's thinking, all right, my opponent's uh, playing a slow maneuvering game in a position where that should not be slow, and we should be playing with some serious pace. So what do you think white played here to try to open things up and use his lead in development? B3. Which move? Pawn. Put the pawn in B3. B3? Can he, can, he, can he play a4 right away? a4, you mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think white actually led with a4, which the point is now you can play bishop d2 and develop with tempo. And now that uh, these positional moves on the queen side are taken care of, now white really wants to blast things open. So how can, all right, first of all, black's king is here, right? Black's king is right here. So when the king is in the center, you want to open the center, especially since you have these nice rooks coming over and bearing down these files. The only thing 
that's stopping you is that these pawns are all in the way. So how can you try to open up these pawns for your rooks? Exchange. Exchange on e5? Yeah. Mm. Well, no, I don't think so. No. Why not? I, I, I think play, e, play e4 now. Yeah, yeah you play e4. Sure. So this is a very combative move because it's leaving behind the d-pawn, which Black's whole idea is he wants to weaken it and attack it. But uh, in exchange, White's going to open things up and put his rook on the mm -hmm. e-file. So Black has to be very careful here. And he, ins he decides that he must uh, trade on e4 because he probably didn't like he probably didn't like this line when I, he simply doesn't have enough pieces to defend his king. And like f4, f5 will come mm -hmm. if you try to play knight to e6. And knight to f4 to d5 is coming. And it's very, very bad. So rather than being greedy, black simply took on e4. White recaptured with the bishop because he still wants this pawn break available. And so uh, black continues with his plan, attacks d4, preparing to open the bishop, and also puts pressure on c5. So again, white's thinking, I really need to open the center, or else my pawns are just going to be weak. I need to use my lead in development. So how do you think he forced the center open? Right. So uh, white didn't want to take here, because then his own pawns start getting in the way after something like queen to c5, for example, just attacking here, mm -hmm. and uh, also with check. So taking there is off the table. And I think actually he played one more preparatory move. Yeah, he played rook to a to e1 first, and then after h4, queen a f2, and castles. Now his pawn break comes. So what do you think he played to break the position? Yeah, that's right. So f4, attacking the e5 pawn and forcing black to uh, do something about it. So black plays pawn to d4. And now white made uh, the mistake that led to his downfall, which is uh, he decided to leave this pawn behind. So best for him would have, just would have been to play something like knight to c1, when after knight to d3, this pawn break is still coming, and black doesn't have time to take here because of bishop takes c6 with the double attack on the queen mm -hmm. and the rook. So, speed game too? no, this is a standard time control. So obviously, black wouldn't take here if uh, white were to play this line and would play something, maybe rook to c8 here, just defending the pawn, maybe trying to get developed and leaving this pawn behind. But uh, instead, white decided that he needed to go right now so he played pawn to f5. Aggressive. It's very, very aggressive. But uh, it's not as good as knight to c1, because after black takes this pawn, which he now can, because this knight's in the way, so there are no discoveries, uh, white simply doesn't have enough. You have to retreat the bishop, first of all, because it's attacked. And then after d3, you have to move your knight, because it's attacked. And after queen to d6, suddenly, Suddenly, your own squares aren't feeling so safe. But uh, you know, white continued pressing. He played bishop to a2, creating some threats. So he's pinning this pawn to the king, which further weakens the light squares. So later on, uh, white's going to try to take here and maybe take here and uh, get in through these light squares. So black played uh, a move you're probably thinking you think about. Winning right now? Yeah, black is winning according to Stockfish, at oh, least. What's the evaluation here? Just curious. I think That's it's winning. minus two almost. Oh, I can pull it up if you like. Oh yeah, minus minus four even. Yeah, white's four. white's totally busted. But uh, oh sorry, I just lost the notation. Let me bring that back up. OK. So yeah. 
So what do you think Black played here? To what about B3, just shutting down? B3? Well, Oops, sorry, I missed the knight. yeah, the knight covers enough. Uh, nothing's being threatened right now, per se, but the threats are soon to come. Time to get the night out. Time to get the night out? Well, that's, we that's pretty slow. You need to play with some more pace, so. What black chose is bishop to d4, when uh, white is forced to play his next move, because otherwise he'd lose a queen. So bishop to e3 is forced. And here, white continu black continues with knight to f4, pushing the queen away. So uh, white's most natural move in the move he chose is just to take on h4. And now he's beginning to have threats of his own, like f6 and queen h6 with a checkmate. Or uh, taking on g6 and a bringing a rook in. Than the queen move then? He no, he doesn't, really. Because, uh, well, first of all, his queen's attacked, so he has to do something about it. And playing something like queen to g2 just simply isn't enough. In positions like these, when both sides are being checkmated, uh, very often your only choice is to try to race your opponent because you can't hold up against uh, so play, all these weak squares. Uh, he could play queen to f4. This doesn't lose any material immediately, but maybe uh, after takes, right? Takes, does black have a tactic here? I'm a 1200 player, how do I know? <laughs> Right, and you don't even have to take the bishop. You can actually just play d2 right away, because this is a pin. So white will lose like a full rook, maybe a little bit more here, at the very least. Yeah, the pawn structure has worse going in. Yeah, the worst pawn structure for sure is very relevant. But uh, So yeah, white pretty much has to take on h4 and go for his own threats instead of trying to cut his losses and deal with what's going on at home. But uh, so black continues with g5, which is actually the only move that keeps the edge. It's very important that g5 gets played to prevent f takes g6 opening up uh, this rook. So that's a brilliant piece? Kind of, yeah. Because g5 doesn't come to mind mm -hmm. uh, very easily. But uh, it is necessary to keep this rook locked in behind this pawn, or else white, white's threats actually become very real, mm -hmm. and they start to work. So g5 was played. And actually, I can show a line here. I think I inputted it. So the most natural move, of course, is just d2, forking these two pieces, trying to win immediately. But then after f takes g6, knight to g5 is forced, mm -hmm. because otherwise this is Mate. checkmate. Mm -hmm. And you don't really have time to take over here, because I will take on d4. And now what happens if you try to queen? Yeah, mm -hmm. checkmate on h8. Mm -hmm. So black needs to deal with these threats. So knight to g5 is pretty much forced. And after that, white can simply take on f7. Knight takes f7. And what do you think white can play here? Involves a few sneaky tactics that uh, you might not notice at bishop first glance. Not bishop takes knight. But he actually takes advantage of this pin somehow. Rook, Rook takes knight. Not quite rook takes knight. Because if, if you're too slow, you always have to be thinking about this. But yeah, just queen to g5, uh, giving check. Yeah, and the reason it's taking advantage of the pin is the knight can't capture, obviously, yeah. because of the pin. So after bishop to g7, which is pretty much forced, you can't play something like king to h7 or king to h8, because they'll be taking here or giving check here. So bishop to g7, and white continues with just taking the pawn. And uh, now if we count material, white's technically ahead of pawn. But uh, the more relevant feature is that black's king is very weak. So here, black has to go in for this perpetual check. He has simply nothing better. So this is why g5 was very, very important. Because f takes g6 is a very strong move that black had to contend with. So g5 secures the win. After queen to h5, now black continues with d2. And uh, there's one more, one more trick you have to watch out for here. So white plays f6, 
black plays queen takes f6. So what happens if we take this queen, obviously? Right, so if he takes over here, we don't recapture. Sorry, we don't recapture because of this check again, taking advantage of this bishop. And then uh, probably white should try to solve his problems here somehow. It's kind of difficult, but uh, that's definitely not accurate to take with the knight. So what we do instead is simply throw in this intermezzo, and we take this rook with check. And white doesn't have enough time to do any of these threats because of this queen. So he would just lose here after like this move. And uh, yeah, probably queen check here and knight check here, picking up the queen. So white can't take the queen. So instead he plays, so sorry. So instead he plays bishop takes d4, uh, trying to uh, remove his pieces from all these pins. So black plays queen takes d4. White plays king takes g or king to g2, and now how does black convert the game? Only one move wins here. Just taking the rook and promoting to a knight. That's right. So what happens Remote if we queen. promote to a queen here? Sorry, I didn't mean to make a rook. But what happens if we make a queen here? You get some pawn. Then the f pawn is just. Right, so despite black having two queens, he can't defend his king enough. So after bishop f7, rook f7, queen f7, king to h8 is the only move. Uh, queen to f8, king to h7 is the only move. Uh, rook to f7, king to g6. Obviously, queen to g7, we would just take it. So king g6, queen, H, or queen g8, king h6, and you're actually checkmated. Mm -hmm. So you don't have time to make a queen, and you definitely don't have time to try to defend like this. So what you have to do is make a knight. And in face of this, Fiddler simply resigns. So what do you think happens if white tries to avoid stepping into this check by playing king to h1? Oh, sorry, we'll start with king to h2. Can black somehow force white to step into the, uh, into the idea? So yeah, this is the right idea. You definitely want to play some check before uh, white can get in. Maybe but maybe e6 would be better though, so you're not So your yeah, so d6 is the right square. So what's the idea after king to h1? Send the knight. The knight forks the king and the queen. Yeah, the knight forks the king and the queen. And the rook. And then this is the more subtle idea, but if the king comes back to g1, where do we check? Yeah, we check on g3 and after king to h1. Oh, well, you don't want to hang this tactic. Oh. Because this would just be a draw. So we need to play a move with the check. Aditya, what were you saying? Knight on f2? Yeah, knight to f2. So what's the idea after white takes it? Yeah, you make a queen. So now that the rook has moved off the back rank, you can promote with check, and that would end the game. So Spiddler was probably quite happy with his position here. Uh, because, or maybe not quite happy, maybe he was probably a little nervous like the rest of us, but I imagine he might have not seen the brilliant promotion to a knight. Because otherwise, he'd have a very good position, and uh, black would have to go in for this perpetual check line that I showed. But I just don't think the 2700 players missed it, do they? Well, he, really hard to find. he didn't miss it here, but maybe, maybe back here he was thinking, you know, maybe. Maybe this is better for me. But. <laughs> well, I mean, white's, white's, white's attack is nothing to laugh at, because black had to find a couple only moves to keep his initiative going and to not crack under the pressure. But yeah, this all started going wrong when white was too impa impatient here with f5. He definitely should have played knight to c1 and then knight to d3 and then f5. 
And box position is actually quite hard to play if uh, all these moves get played. So are there any questions about the game? Any questions about promoting? All right, well, thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed.